We've all heard the phrase, he who is without sin cast the first stone. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Looks like Homer Stokes is the kind of fellow who wants to cast the first stone. Yah without sin can cast the first stone. Well, I admit it looks bad, Flanders. But haven't you heard of, let he who is without sin cast the first stone? Oh, got him, Dad! It's basically saying, hey, we all mess up, so get off my back. This phrase comes from a story in the Bible about a woman who was caught in the act of adultery, being dragged out in the street in front of Jesus to be stoned. The Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus. If he said yes, and he participated in the stonings, then it doesn't really help his peaceful image. But if he says no, then he's disobeying the law. So Jesus then bends over, he writes something in the sand, and then he says, He among you who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Oh, cool. Ian McShane. I love Ian McShane. <laughs> that guy's in everything. And then everyone gets super embarrassed, and they walk away. And then he tells the woman, Go and sin no more. Guys, let's not forget that Jesus was an immigrant from heaven. Oh, boy. Yeah, and he had to go home, too, and it was not a fun trip. Plus, it could not have been easy being a white guy in the Middle East. <laughs> I've heard so many sermons about this story in my life, which makes sense. It's a good moral tale about checking yourself before wrecking yourself. Or, like, not passing judgments on others without looking at yourself. A lot of pastors like to try to figure out what Jesus was writing in the sand. I personally think... The, he wrote the names of the men who were there and their sins beside their names. And I think what Jesus was doing, it's very profound. I believe he was doodling in the sand. And they love to use this passage to, to examine Jesus' character and Jesus' heart. If you're without sin, why don't you throw a stone at her? Here Jesus does what the law was meant to do. The law is meant to hold up a mirror to our own guilt. It's not meant to be a weapon that we use to harm others. It's meant to be a mirror that shows us what we are like. And Jesus does that beautifully. If you're without sin, you throw a stone. So what are they gonna do? He has the right to throw stones into my face and into your face because we are all guilty. But, he didn't do it. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Blamo! And I find this all really interesting. Every time I heard this story after Bible college, I wondered why anyone would teach this story as historical fact. Because I studied the Bible, just like these guys did, and I know that the story didn't show up in copies of the Bible until like the 4th century, and wasn't really common until the 12th century. And most Bibles note this before the passage in some ways, usually simply saying it wasn't in early manuscripts. Like even people I disagree with would point this out. One of them is that, and this is this is gets into hot water quick, uh, in John 8 verses 1 through 11, this is very likely not original in the Gospel of John. Now, this is one of the few passages, uh, you know, here, the ending of Mark. Mark, Mark is debated. Mark has more evidence that it's original. John 8, most, almost everybody agrees, is not actually original to the Gospel of John. And so we, we look at that and we say, uh, long story short, historically, it's probably a true story about Jesus, probably. But to call it authoritative scripture is, um, is perhaps problematic. And so, so when I would hear these sermons, I would wonder, does the pastor really not know this? And as I always deconstruct my faith, I couldn't help but wonder if, if all pastors were just dishonest. But I don't think so. I think it's way more nuanced than that. Hey everybody, thank you so much for liking this, for subscribing, for commenting, for all those wonderful things that help that almighty algorithm. It really helps me out and I love you for it. And uh, I also put the links down below for our social media. Join us there as well as the link for our Patreon. And guess what? Merch. What? Yeah, merch. 
Um, not a lot there yet, but uh, there'll be more, and it'll come. And I got this sweet hoodie, and I like wearing it, and it's comfortable. In a recent Vanity Fair interview, Jerry Falwell Jr., who used to be the president of one of the largest conservative Christian universities, said, Because of my last name, people think I'm a religious person, but I'm not. Later clarifying that he does believe in Jesus and all that, but just isn't as strict with his religion as his dad was. And to be honest, I'd hate to be associated with this guy, too. I, I really believe that the pagans and the abortionists and the feminists and the gays and the lesbians who are actively trying to make that an alternative lifestyle, the ACLU, People for the American Way, all of them who tried to secularize America, I point the thing in their face and say, you help this happen. But that never stopped Junior from trying to force his father's values on an entire country for his own financial gain. Mr. Trump has added a plank to this party's platform to repeal IS, IRS rules sponsored by Lyndon Johnson in 1954, barring churches and nonprofits from expressing political free speech. Conservative universities and churches, however, have been investigated, while authorities have too often turned a blind eye toward liberal groups including universities where left-wing left ideology is so pervasive that they have in, have in effect become democratic voter indoctrination camps. In 1972, a documentary called Marjo was released that pulled back the curtain on faith healing to show a young evangelist who was tired of all the lies and wanted to show how it's all done. I had a thing where there's a special kind of ink you can buy and you put it on and with perspiration when the salt starts to come out and you start to perspire, uh, it'll turn red, and so I painted a cross, you know, I just did a cross like this on my head. And while I was preaching, uh, the cross started to show immediately, people started nudging each other, you know, and of course it started, it went away, I think, after a while, it only lasts so long where I wiped away, I don't remember. But afterwards, I mean, like I had that whole audience, I had one of the biggest meetings that I've ever had, because they saw that cross, said, oh, Brother Marge, while you were preaching tonight, the cross was over your head. I mean, that was convinced them, you know, that it was really very, very real, and it made it very easy for me to... Uh, take offerings and, and receive money. And since then, there have been so many exposés on the tricks and cons of faith healing. How do they pick the ones they want to go on stage at that point? They have staff members that go through and give them a quick, uh, quick interview. And they'll ask them, Can you, you know, what's wrong with you? Oh, I've had uh, rheumatoid arthritis of my left shoulder. I can't lift it. All of a sudden, can you lift your shoulder? Because if you can't lift your shoulder, you can't go on stage. According to Andrew, the screening system has one purpose, to keep the truly sick or disabled away from Benny Hinn. Those people are never near, allowed near the stage. In our original broadcast... To see an old magician's trick. As Diane sits down, Grant grabs her shoe, pulls out the heel of the shoe to make the leg look longer. As he prays, he slowly pushes the heel of the shoe back in, giving the illusion that the short leg has grown. There it is, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah! My favorite was when the late great James Randi exposed Peter Popoff, who was listening to his wife on a radio, and uh, not the Holy Spirit, as he claimed. Now, amen, it's all right to praise the Lord. I suspected that Popoff's revelations were other than divine. A radio scanner we brought to the hall picked up a decidedly worldly source. Hello, Petey. Can you hear me? If you can't, you're in trouble. Popoff was being prompted by his wife through a wireless earpiece. John? Dearly Johnson. She'd gotten her information from prayer cards filled out by the faithful before the show began. She's about to get rid of the walker. You want to get rid of this walker, sister? And then you look at pastors and you see all the greed. November 29th, 2013, JMMI paid over $6,000 to Louis Vuitton. Mm -hmm. Yes. What would that be for? Well, this is for clothes concerning my TV ministry as well. Oh, you have to wear Louis Vuitton? Oh, it don't matter what name it is. The point is clothing are allocated to us for ministry purposes as well. A lot of interest in the church's finances, in your finances, and your personal lifestyle. 
do you ever think, I'm just going to release these records to shut everybody up? Oh, no. I, I would never make a decision about how the church's finances were communicated based on the agenda of a reporter. What about your personal or a newspaper? finances? Or your personal lifestyle? Well, in my personal lifestyle, I know that we have to have integrity, and I know that we have to be generous, and I know the extent to which that is true of me and Holly. So to go on record and say, here's how much money we've given away, and here's what we do with our finances, to me, that would be the most arrogant thing that I could do, and it would rob me of the blessing of doing what Jesus said, which is when you give, you don't get up and tell everybody how much you've given. So when you share one part of a picture, whether that's how much one of our our staff members that you met when you came in, what they make, that's between them and God. Mm -hmm. That's not mine to release. And the same with my family. I wouldn't do that to my wife and my kids. I wouldn't do that to any of our staff members. And the hypocrisy. Michael, good morning. It was a huge fall from grace. Carl Lentz's global following included Justin Bieber and a long list of celebrities and pro athletes. Well, now without a job and trying to repair his marriage, his former mistress tells us her side of what happened. And how disgusting some of them can be. Church video. This week, the elders received a letter with 13 accusations against our pastor. Then the bombshell. Radio host Mancow plays an audio tape where McDonald clearly had no clue his mic was hot. The plan to uh, put on our uh, computer. When you heard the tapes. <laughs> Sick. Depraved. A pastor, no less. And you start to think that it's all a scam, and they are all just lying. And don't get me wrong, a lot of it is a scam, and a lot of it is just people lying. But honestly, I don't think that's the majority. I had a number of leadership roles in church, and I never felt like I was a liar. Besides maybe to myself. I remember in Bible college studying Martin Luther and his teachings about being justified by faith alone. He quoted the book of Romans stating, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And then reading the book of James that said, You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. These are opposite teachings. And I remember wrestling with the fact that the Bible seemed to disagree with itself. And the conclusion I came to was that these were written by different authors to different audiences to address problems in those different audiences. Parkour! Which negates the idea that the Bible is still as relevant today as it was when it was written, but that worked for me. And this is something we see all the time when people try to reconcile contradictions in the Bible. There is one word that almost always will clear up any contradictory confusion. Context, context, context. Okay, it was the same word, but it was used three times, and it will almost always help you to understand what the author was intending to say, even if it appears to contradict another part of the Bible. For example, the Bible has two accounts of how Saul died, but one of them is told through the perspective of another person, so you can just say that that person was lying. What we're also wanting to get uh, past, just because the Bible records something, it doesn't mean that it's kind of affirming or approving. And we talk about this a yeah. lot. Uh, and so what you've got is just a true account of a false story. right? And so that's the way to kind of look at it. The Bible can show some false stories, and, and it's still true, in that it's giving a true account of a false story. And so our job then, as is, I mean, hey, look, you can take that option if you want. And atheists do, yeah. or non-believers do. They'll say the Bible's just contradicted. Um, and th they can point out a bunch of things to, to show that. But as Christians, what we can look at is go, we give the Bible the benefit of the doubt. Right. And we can see some of these problems that are brought up, but we think that these passages can be reconciled. I mean, not only that, you got to keep in mind, uh, the end of 2 Samuel I mean, at the end of 1 Samuel and then Samuel chapter 1. I mean, it's the same author. Yeah. So you think that uh, between those two spots that the author <laughs> forgot right. what happened? I mean, that's pretty desperate right there. <laughs> right. So let's give the benefit of the doubt. Right, exactly. I mean, these books weren't signed by Samuel. It's not really known who wrote these books. A lot of the Old Testament is a collection of other books put together. So it makes sense that there are two versions of the death of Saul just like there are two versions of who killed Goliath or two creation stories. 
Here's what happened. On the third day, God made the plants, okay, grass, plants, trees. On the fifth day, He made the birds out of the water. On the sixth day, He made the animals, and then He made man, and then He made the garden and put the man in the garden. Now, all of chapter 2 is describing what happened in the garden only. It's not describing the whole world. God made more trees, and it's only the two kinds, the trees that are good for food and the trees that are good to the sight. Beautiful garden. The rest of the world's already full of trees. He's describing what happened in the garden. And then he made one more of each animal so that Adam could name them and select a wife. And so while Adam's standing there, up out of the ground is coming one more of each animal. Now the rest of the world's already full of animals. This is just for Adam to see God do it and to make a wife and to create a wife, to, to select a wife. Up comes a giraffe. He says, giraffe, no thanks. You know, hippopotamus, no thanks. You know, elephant, no thanks. Hamster, no thanks. You know, time out. Is he saying that God wanted Adam to pick a wife out of the animals? Did God originally intend the world to be like Bojack Horseman? Also, you two are dating? Yeah. You're dating him? Yes. This is your boyfriend? That is correct. Uh-huh. You are going out with you. Uh-huh. But in a sexual way, not just as friends. That's right. You have seen her naked many times. I mean, there was a talking snake. And it's not like the New Testament is any better. The Gospels are kind of a hot mess of contradictions. And as the words of God, God is a truth teller. He, it's impossible for him to lie. He's one who tells complete truth. So in everything that the, the scriptures seek to affirm, they're completely truthful. At the same time we, we acknowledge this, we acknowledge that if you were to put side by side Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, you'd find these surface level incongruities that to the, to the superficial reader say, well, what, what's going on here? Is this two people here? Was there one person here? Did this happen this way? Did this happen this way? And, and I would argue that these are the same kind of surface level incongruities that we would expect in any historical retelling of an incident by different eyewitnesses. Every kind of eyewitness account is going to have summarizing, partial reporting, it's going to have paraphrasing, it's going to have rearranging of the material chronologically, and that's exactly what we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Like how Judas died. So Judas, the way that you reconcile this is that he did, after betraying Jesus uh, for 30 pieces of silver, what he did is he went out to the field of Akadama, the field of blood, and he hung himself on a tree. But you got to imagine that this tree, that he would have went up on a tree uh, over a branch, and the branch maybe uh, would have suspended itself over a cliff. Right. And so after hanging himself, you can imagine the branch not being able to withstand Judas's weight. Yeah. And so what happens? The branch breaks. He falls uh, off the cliff then with the branch, hits a rock, and he's disemboweled. Right. So he sought to hang himself, and in the process of hanging himself, the branch breaks, and he falls, hits a rock, and he's disemboweled. So both accounts are true. See, it wasn't a contradiction. It's just that Judas's death was a Rube Goldberg machine. <laughs> or how many angels were at the tomb? So the question is, who's right? Is it Matthew and Mark that say the angel or one angel? Or is it Luke and John that refer to two? Well, this is also another very easily explainable contradiction or alleged error, if you will. Notice that Matthew and Mark do not say in any way or at any time that there is only one angel at the tomb. They just say the angel, whereas uh, Luke and John say that there are two. And so the idea here is that there was one angel that was the miracle working angel, and that was the one that Matthew and Mark was focusing their attention on, never suggesting that there could not have possibly been another angel present at Jesus' tomb. What should you do when an atheist, an unbeliever does the old, aha, what about this contradiction? Might I suggest to you, they're not really looking for you to harmonize them for them. I might suggest a couple of options. You could say, friend, if I can explain to you reasonably how these two statements harmonize, would you accept that? And then be willing to say, okay, that isn't genuinely a contradiction in the Bible. Most likely they're not going to say, yeah, please let me in because I'm more than willing to have ears to hear. 
You could give that a go. It's probably not going to happen because it reveals that they really don't want to understand the harmony of the Bible. They just want to use it as a card to slap down to go, just leave me alone. I don't want to deal with this whole Jesus Christ exclusivity and grace alone and faith alone and repentance and faith. I just, uh, there's contradictions in the Bible! Or maybe just they actually don't harmonize the way you think they do? See, I think there are a few things going on here, but I think it's mostly a combination of cognitive dissonance and confirmation bias. First off, cognitive dissonance is the idea that our brains don't like holding competing beliefs. In this case, that the Bible is the inerrant word of God and that the Bible has contradictions. It's hard to hold these two ideas in your head at the same time. So you accept the first explanation that helps you harmonize these two conflicting ideas. So it's not that people are trying to be dishonest and trying to cover up that there are errors. It's that their brains are in a self-defense mode. Excuse me, sir. Have you- I got no no! Wow. What? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Why did you do that? Oh, well, she came at me and that was sort of my instinct. That was amazing. I think this little offhand comment shows it best. So once again, no need to fear here. There is no error. There is no contradiction. No need to fear. And that's what it was for me. I wasn't trying to get to the truth about whether there were errors and contradictions in the Bible. I wanted to get over my fear of the fact that the Bible seems to contradict itself. Because that would mean the way I saw the world was wrong, and I did not want to start over. Like these guys saying there have been no changes to the Bible. Jonathan, has the Bible changed over time? No, it hasn't. And uh, one thing that's so cool is just recently at the Qumran Caves over there in the Dead Sea, we had the Dead Sea Scrolls. And these are manuscripts that are thousands of years old from what we had originally found, which was what? The, when were the Qumran Caves actually discovered? That little boy throwing 1947, the I believe, around there. So in the there. 40s, the, the ones we had before that were hundreds of years recorded later. So this little boy throws this rock. It was a grown man. He was a Bedouin shepherd. Not like a shepherd boy, but like a, a dude. And he finds all these manuscripts of the, the, um, the book of Isaiah. And just recently, even more were discovered and more, even more were found. And I'm going to go ahead and take a stab in the dark here and say they again confirm that Scripture is accurate. And the manuscripts we have today, the copies we have today that we have on our phones and in our Bibles are going to confirm with incredible accuracy what the Bible has to say. And everything from the verbiage to the nouns, the way the sentences are structured, it's all going to be there. The Dead Sea Scrolls don't contain the day of rest in the creation story. Chapters and verses and whole books have been added and removed and added again over time. Many times, like I said with the woman caught in adultery story, it'll say right in your Bible, that's in your hand or on your phone, that this wasn't in early manuscripts. Yeah, generally, when people ask me, is the Bible changed? I just go, nope, moving on. They go, okay, yeah, it works. And the evidence is there. Again, these are snorkeling answers, but uh, the Bible has definitely not been changed uh, throughout the years. Another way to look at this is to, is to look at how people talk about doubt. So what do we do in times of doubt? Well, I like to think of a quote by one of my favorite authors, and it goes like this. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way that the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. You see, remembering the way that God has worked in the past is the remedy for overcoming doubts in our life. And, and for me, in this moment, I choose to remember the times that God has worked in my life. So we overcome doubt by remembering times in our past when God came through. For me, faith has never been the absence of doubt. Faith is not the absence of doubt. It is the means to overcome it. Do you hear what I'm saying? We overcome doubt by having faith in God. Everyone, remain calm. Every crisis of faith is an opportunity for more faith. When God deals you an 11, you don't fold, you double down and always hit on a soft 16. The work of the Holy Spirit in the hour of trial is to preserve you from faith-destroying doubt and to give you the sweet gift of assurance. We overcome doubt by the Holy Spirit. I have those doubts about my salvation and even the existence of God at times. It is always when I have not been strong in my prayer life. Because when I'm praying and I'm reading the Word of God and I'm pursuing what He wants, 
the way he answers my prayers, it is so blatantly obvious. And this is not just this, you know, crutch that I'm trying to make up. No, this is reality. I mean, during those times when I am tight with God and I'm walking with him and I am praying like crazy and I'm seeing, you can't tell me that God doesn't exist. I would look at you like you're crazy, like your mom doesn't exist. You know, I mean, what are you, what are you talking about? We overcome doubt by praying and reading our Bible. This spot where we're like, I believe, help my unbelief. This spot where we're going, I believe, but I'm struggling to hang on to that belief that God steps into that space. And that faith is that mustard seed of faith that puts the Lord to work in our lives. Look at me. I don't know what version of Christianity you've bought into, but there's really only one biblical version of it. And, and let me catch you up on just a little bit of that. Uh, the little bit of that that you really need to embrace and know is there's not a day coming where you're not going to have to wrestle with your flesh and get to this place where trials will not eventually wear you down to the point of wrestling with doubt. Let's talk about this relationship with God for a moment because that's how it's framed, right? It's, it's a relationship. If you were in a committed relationship, but you kept having doubts about this relationship, you feel like they've been drinking again when they'd said they'd stopped. There are signs they may have been cheating. You feel like they may be gaslighting you and making you feel less than. Whatever your doubts about this relationship may be, is the healthy thing to do to overcome these feelings of doubt? By remembering the good times? By trusting that they are a good person? By letting them convince you your doubts aren't valid? Or is it healthier to talk it out? To go to counseling? To maybe leave the relationship if it's causing more harm than good. Like sometimes he's not even trying anymore. Like this isn't even worth saving. Oh, okay. Well, sometimes I feel like that we should be more like the Yangs. Or maybe I should be more like your beautiful Zook. Oh, go. You're made to feel like, sure, we all have doubts, but there are ways to get past it instead of being given permission to ask questions and to actually search for the truth. Triumph of my faith is not the absence of doubt. The triumph of my faith is the ability for the light to shine in the deepest, darkest recesses of my heart. I got doubts, but I trust him anyway. Stop yelling at me! Because even though they acknowledge that everyone has doubts and offers ways to get past those doubts, if someone doesn't get past those doubts and walks away from their faith, the reaction is a lot different. Let's start with this clip that has been getting a lot of traction on social media lately. You and I, look, look, okay. You and I are in a day and age where deconstruction and the turning away from and leaving the faith has become some sort of sexy thing to do. I contend that if you ever experience the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ actually, that that's really impossible to deconstruct from. Amen. But if all you ever understand Christianity to be is a moral code, then I totally get it. If you really experience God, you wouldn't leave. But if it was just a moral code, then it makes sense. This is setting up a few things that, that we'll get into. The trend that I've noticed in watching some of these videos is that people often come from, um, you know, a pretty fundamentalist um, background. So meaning that, you know, gen generally maybe it was like Southern Baptist or, you know, fundamentalist Baptist. It was like maybe no alcohol or like, you know, very strict in the rules department. Rarely, and it does happen though, but rarely does it come from some sort of like seeker friendly, um, wishy washy church. It's like, no, these kids were like grew up in a place where the Bible was held in high esteem. And now they're seeing, hey, look, I don't actually believe what's in the Bible. So while the deconstructionist movement tries to portray itself as just people trying to seek the truth, there's definitely other factors at play. Again, basically, they were taught rules and they didn't have a proper relationship. This is the type of deconstruction where Jesus and others use scripture to critique the world's corruption of the church. But then there is another type of deconstruction, that of Western millennials, who use the world to critique scripture's authority over the church. The former is the way of Jesus, and we want to actually do that. It's what's caused us to rethink a lot of issues from military violence, to the role of women in the church, to how we read scripture. It's caused us to rethink lots of, to politics, lots of things. But the latter is not the way of Jesus. So it's okay to question things 
And it's okay to explore what you believe, but only if you use your Bible as the standard. If you use worldly sources like history books or science books that show the Bible has some issues, then that's the wrong way to do it. I'm Carl Sagan. Just how old is our planet? Scientists believe it's four bi- Hundreds and hundreds of years old. Scientists have determined that the universe was created by a- God. Big Bang. Ignore those who are either not Christians or they're just in process and need some work themselves. <laughs> and find those Christians in your life that you know care about you aren't going to be judgmental, who are going to talk through these issues with you, find them. And also I'd say if you really want to find the answers, the answers are out there. Not certainty. Uh, This has come up a lot with my Mm. conversation with people who used to believe, like, I'm just not certain anymore. And I go, look, certainty is not the standard. But if you want to know, we can have confidence that this is true. And Christianity actually makes sense of the world. There's answers if you're willing to find it. So don't talk to non-Christians, don't talk to weak Christians, and only read information that will confirm the Bible. And let's go back to Matt Chandler for a second. To receive, to receive the mercy of God in your soul is to forever be changed. I'm not saying you don't struggle at times. I'm not saying you don't get confused at times. I'm not saying you don't get bothered at times. I'm saying you you can't walk away. So so we've got to get the gospel right. There's there's much at stake here. And so that's what we're going to do. If you are a real Christian and really let God into your life, you can never leave. And that's the main one, the bell of the ball. If someone does leave, they were never really a Christian to begin with. A few years ago, Joshua Harris, who wrote the incredibly damaging purity culture book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, said that he was no longer a Christian. All the measurements that I have for defining a Christian, I'm not a Christian. What do you mean by that? I was really just trying to be honest about the fact that all the ways that I had defined faith and Christianity, that I was no longer choosing to live according to those. Now let's look at a totally rational response to that. I don't know if you heard the breaking news story, but Josh Harris has decided to kiss nothing goodbye. Why? Because, well, he was never a believer in the first place, but he has decided to recant his Christian faith, which means the universe is done. Josh Harris is the first man... (laughs) to be bigger, stronger, and more powerful than the God who says, he who began a good work in you is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Not gonna happen anymore. Josh was the one who was able to get out of his salvation. Don't you see? The intercessory work of Jesus Christ failed because of Josh Harris denouncing his faith. Are you okay, Todd? Do you need somebody to talk to? But this happens every single time somebody who's well-known says they are no longer a Christian. Like YouTubers Rhett and Link. County man. Listen, I probably am going to have health problems later in life. because. Did you just refer to yourself as baloney 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 man? man. How much baloney I had. I think some of the most popular deconstructionist videos are Rhett and Link, which I have responded to. Um, They were Christians for, I mean, they they weren't actually Christians. Um, They were people that, you know, verbalized their belief in Christ, but actually there was no transformation of the heart. But as they were kind of deconstructing um, their own faith, they realized, look, we actually don't believe any of this, really. And so they moved on. Really? These guys didn't believe? Can you make a light without a light switch or a water without a spigot? Can you make a man from a dustpan? Well, you can't, but guess what God did it. Let there be light, there it was. Plus bugs and rhinoceroses. Adam and Eve had one rule to follow, but they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, causing trouble for all subsequent people. Listen to Rhett explain his hesitancy in questioning Jesus. Oh, the closer I got to it, the more I couldn't quite shake these questions that continued to linger. And the question, the place that I had sort of put a barrier around and said, we're not going there. Sure, we can talk about evolution, we can talk about the historicity of the Old Testament, but where I'm not gonna go is I'm not gonna go to Jesus. I'm not gonna question 
Jesus, but I just couldn't help myself because I was like, my understanding of who Jesus is is not just based on my experience with him personally, but it's also based on what the Bible has to say about him. This is why how we know what there is to know about Jesus. And again, when I looked into this, my world was rocked in a very big way. They didn't set out to leave their faith. They didn't want it to not be true. But when they came face to face with the reality, they decided to be honest with themselves. Saying that these people never really believed is a great way to tell yourself that you will never be like them, that you can never walk away from your faith. It's a way to say that your experiences have been genuine and there's no way that they had these same experiences. When that's simply not true. It's another way to lie to yourself and say that your faith is impenetrable and you will believe forever. Because right now, your faith is the most important thing in the world to you. And it doesn't matter how many of us who have left thought the same way. I personally thought it would be impossible that I'd ever lose my faith and walk away. And the thing is, if any of these people ever walk away, they would say that they were wrong. And then they would be told that they were never really Christians to begin with. I'm just going to come out and make this pitch. The old gods are dead. F- all previous existing religions all hail the one true God, the giant head in the sky. There are children of God. God. Da, 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 Bob, Bob, I get it. But unless this can beat that, what have you done for me lately? All this to say, and yeah, it took me a bit to get there. The human brain is a complex machine, but its primary purpose is survival, not to know everything that can be known. So sometimes those survival instincts kick in to protect our belief systems. After all, it could be what ties you to your family or your social circle. For pastors and church staff, it's what pays the bills. For many people, it feels like the only way they can have meaning or hope. So yeah, there are some blatantly dishonest people out there, but for the most part, it's not about dishonesty. It's about survival. But then for some people, at some point, we realize that maybe it's okay to take that step out of our comfort zone. Maybe it's okay to question things. Maybe our lives won't be over if we listen to someone else's perspective. If we read that book we are afraid to read. If we watch that YouTube video we are afraid to watch. Maybe it's okay to admit that we don't have all the answers and it's okay to start learning something new and strip away how we thought the world worked to maybe get closer to the actual truth. Keep searching, folks. Thanks all for making it this far. Uh, If you know somebody who might like it, send it their way. And as always, I love you. Work, 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 Sky Moon. (laughs) We've all heard the phrase, he's, he who's is it? Who's the guy? That's Trevor. He's the one. Cognitive dissonance. And there is no welcome at.